Good morning, afternoon, evening. My name is Diana Ginsberg, and I am the CEO of Olam, tuning in from Jerusalem. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our sixth annual Focal Point Conference. Over the next two days, over 250 international development practitioners, funders, communal leaders, rabbis, service program alumni, and others will join together to explore some of the most pressing global challenges and ask what we, the Jewish community, can do to step up at this time. We have people tuning in from 16 countries around the world, the US, Israel, UK, Brazil, India, Turkey, South Africa, Uganda, and more. I am thrilled that 40% of those here are attending Focal Point for the first time. Whether you are new or a Focal Point veteran, whether you actively work on global issues or this is your first time being exposed to this field, we hope you'll contribute your unique perspective to this conversation. In an attempt to make Focal Point as inclusive as possible, we have enabled auto transcription for all sessions. If you would like to see a live transcript, please click on the button that says CC Live Transcript on your Zoom panel at the bottom of your screen. You can enable and disable the transcript at any time. I want to take this opportunity to thank our strategic partner, Shalom Corps, for helping make this entire event possible. And I'm excited for our partnership with Shalom Corps on the effective communication session tomorrow. Much gratitude as well to our Focal Point sponsors for their support. The Charles Bronfman Prize, Pack with Purpose, JDC and Twine, ROI, and JW3. And last but not least, to Olam's board members and donors for their ongoing support year-round. Olam is a network of Jewish individuals and organizations working in the fields of global service, international development, and humanitarian aid. Currently, we have over 60 partner organizations, all of which self-identify as Jewish or Israeli and work with vulnerable communities in developing countries. Collectively, our partners work in 68 countries and employ close to 2,400 staff. Ulam serves as a convener, mobilizing Jewish leaders and organizations to take meaningful action in support of the world's most vulnerable. In many ways, time has appeared to stand still this past year. Although a year has passed since the last focal point in October 2020, we are still meeting virtually. While COVID vaccine rollout has progressed in some places, Many of us are still unable to gather or travel safely. The pandemic and its economic impact continue to take a toll. But make no mistake, time has not stood still. Things are moving. Olam's partners continue to innovate, find new and creative ways to support and work in deep partnership with communities most impacted by the pandemic. And here at Olam, we have also had a busy year. We welcome six new partners since the last focal point. AgriFriends, Arava Institute, Ben Gurion University Africa Center, SIMI, Engineers Without Borders Israel and Sundara, and onboarded 27 individual members, Jews who work in international development, global service and humanitarian aid, but outside of a Jewish framework. And we have also approved and rolled out a new strategy focusing on three things. One, strengthening our practitioner network. Two, empowering Jewish leaders to become champions for global issues. This includes both established and emerging leaders, professional and lay. What might it look like if every Jewish leader around the world had the skills, knowledge, connections, and passion to engage with global issues? Number three, increasing the visibility of Olam and our partners in the global Jewish community. I'm particularly proud of three programs we recently launched. Aspire, a set of tools and resources to enable Ulam's partners to deepen their ethical best practices. In addition, a partnership with the Shalom Hartman Institute, which includes a year-long research seminar on global justice and the Israel-Diaspora relationship. And finally, a deepened partnership with the Jewish Service Alliance, Power by Repair the World, which will help us collectively increase the reach of Jewish service. If you're interested in learning more about these programs and others and how you too can get involved, please check out Olam's website. The theme of this year's focal point is shaping a Jewish vision for a more equitable and sustainable world. When we say a Jewish vision, we refer to a vision that mobilizes the Jewish community, is informed by Jewish history, 
and draws inspiration from Jewish texts and values. Indeed, Moses was the quintessential Jewish visionary. The few episodes that the Torah shares about Moses's early life highlight his singular sight and vision. According to the text, Moses sees the burdens of his fellow Jews. He sees an Egyptian striking a Jewish slave, and he sees that no one is around in the face of injustice. In fact, it was Moses's sight that caught God's attention, sparked their first encounter, and it was the reason God chose Moses to lead the Jewish people from slavery to freedom. Standing in the wilderness, Moses sees a bush on fire. Most people would have walked on by, but he stops and turns aside. Vayar Hashem Kisar Yerot. God sees that Moses turned to see. God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he answered, here I am. In that moment, Moses defined what it means to have a Jewish vision. It is not only to see, but to take notice. It's to pay attention when others would prefer to look away or simply not be bothered. It's to confront human suffering and a natural world ablaze and to take action. What does it look like to confront the brokenness in today's world and envision a different future? How can we transform our visions into action that can lift people out of poverty, keep them safe from climate disasters and ensure health, even for those in the most remote locations? That is the topic of our opening plenary. We will hear from four Jewish leaders as they share their own visions and draw upon their expertise in global health, environmental activism, diversity and inclusion, philanthropy, and more. Today's plenary is being sponsored by the Charles Bronfman Prize, an annual award given to a humanitarian who's under 50 years old, whose work is grounded in Jewish values and is of universal benefit. The goal of the prize is to recognize dynamic leaders whose innovation and impact serve as an inspiration for the next generation. Two of those featured in today's plenary, Dr. Jessica Beckerman and David Hertz, are previous awardees of the prize. This plenary will be moderated by Lisa Eisen, co-president of Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Philanthropy. In this capacity, Lisa spearheads efforts to strengthen the Jewish community by supporting initiatives around the world that engage young Jews in service and social action, help people experience and learn about Israel and support efforts to welcome all those who seek to participate in Jewish life. She also leads initiatives to advance gender and reproductive equity, as well as empower women and girls in the US and around the world. Among her many, many, many commitments, Lisa also sits on a long board and has been a champion and a cheerleader of our work since day one. It is now my pleasure to turn the virtual floor over to Lisa. Thank you, Diana, for that warm introduction. And thank you to the alum team for putting together this year's focal point. It promises to be a fascinating gathering. As a founding board member of alum, I am so proud of what this organization has accomplished in just six years. Olam has convened and supported an entire field of global Jewish service and international development with more than 55 Jewish and Israeli organizations committed to living out the Jewish values of tzedek, justice, and tikkun olam, the Jewish imperative to repair the world. Between a global pandemic, climate change, the refugee crisis, and more, olam and the organizations in this network could not be more necessary now, when so many people are in need of our partnership. The theme of our panel discussion is Jewish visions of an equitable and sustainable future. What does that mean? And why are we talking about this right now? As we know, the pandemic has brought suffering on a massive scale, revealing and exacerbating moral cracks in our society's foundations that have been there for a long time. The world's most vulnerable populations, women and girls, people living in extreme poverty, people who rely on the informal economy to make a living, people with disabilities, ethnic minorities, refugees, and other forcibly displaced people are all bearing the brunt of COVID's health and economic consequences, as well as of the climate crisis. When you consider the immensity of this suffering, 
Despair may be a natural response. It almost seems impossible to even begin to make a difference. But Judaism is a religion that doesn't accept reality at face value. It encourages us to confront the brokenness of the world, to engage in repairing it, and no matter what, to retain hope. To quote Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Zichrono Levracha, to be a Jew is to be an agent of hope in a world serially threatened by despair. Judaism is a sustained struggle, the greatest ever known, against the world that is in the name of the world that could be, should be, but is not yet. In the video we just saw, Olam partners from around the world articulated their visions of what a more equitable, sustainable world might look like. This panel is an opportunity to do a deeper dive into those ideas. Our panelists have diverse expertise in a variety of fields, and they will explore what we as the Jewish people can do to move us closer to these visions of the world that could be and should be. So let's meet our panelists. First, Dr. Jessica Beckerman is co-founder and chief medical officer of NUSO. Jessica is a health justice advocate and individual member of Olam's Practitioner Network, working to end preventable deaths rooted in poverty by building rapid universal health care systems worldwide. In her role as Musso's co-founder and chief medical officer, she oversees quality and integrated care delivery from community to clinic to hospital. Since 2004, Jessica has worked in Mali, where she was a Fulbright scholar. Notably, her work in Mali through Musso resulted in a tenfold decrease in child mortality. Amazing. Making Mali's rate lower than any other country in Africa. She currently works as an obstetrician at Highland Hospital, a teaching and public safety net hospital in Oakland, California. Next, we have Gamal Palmer, who is principal and founder of Conscious Builders. Gamal has worked with hundreds of leaders, executives, educators, and CEOs to help them diversify their organizations and teams and increase effectiveness and collaboration. Through the Diversity Gym, his signature workshop, He's worked with large-scale universities, businesses, and nonprofits, and helped thousands of individuals find acceptance and foster inclusion. After working with social entrepreneurs for over 15, and in over 15 African countries, uh, Gamal is a Schusterman Senior Fellow and a board member for the Jews of Color Initiative, Upstart Lab, SRE Network, and American Jewish World Service, which is an Olam partner organization. Next, we have Carly Mizell, who is in Azerbaijan right now. She is the global CEO of the Kirsch Foundation, a philanthropy launched by a South African family dedicated to strengthening and fostering the relationship between Israel and the African continent. The foundation funds multiple Olam partner organizations, including ISRA Aid, Innovation Africa, and JDC Grid. Most recently, Carly led the Kirsch Foundation in supporting ISRA Aid's work to expand COVID-19 vaccine access in Eswatini. Carly's previous positions include Director of Communications and Philanthropy at Tamaris, Public Affairs Advisor to Israeli Ambassador to the UK, Ron Prosor, and Head of Communications for the Britain Israel Communications and Research Center. And last, but certainly not least, is my longtime friend, Yossi Abramowitz, Yosef, also known as Captain Sunshine, <laughs> President and CEO of Energia Global. Yossi serves uh, uh, as a CEO of Energia Global, a Jerusalem-based impact investment platform and alum partner organization, which works to advance the environmental and humanitarian goals of providing affordable green power to underserved populations. Yossi was named by CNN as one of the top six leading green pioneers and by PV Tech as one of the most inspiring solar CEOs worldwide. He's also the winner of the Green Globe, Israel's highest environmental award, and he's been present at every focal point so far. And he is also calling in from COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. So we hope he'll share some insights from, from being on the ground there. So thank you to all of our panelists for being here today and for everyone in the audience. Um, and just before we get started, I want to note that there will be a Q&A period for the panel, so you can feel free at any time to type in questions you have in the chat box as they come up, um, and you can share questions whether you're on the Zoom or uh, on the Facebook 
feed. So let's get started. We are going to keep it lively by moving quickly through some lightning rounds of questions. So first, before we can articulate visions of the future, we need to ground ourselves in the past. As Pierre K. Avot, Ethics of the Father states, know from where you come and where you are going. With that in mind, could each of you please tell us briefly about yourselves, your family background, the upbringing that led you to the work you do today? What are the experiences in your life that have shaped how you see the world and how you view your responsibility to its most vulnerable citizens? So we'll go in the order that I introduced you. Jessica, can you please start? Hi, good morning. Um, it's such a, a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. Uh, so I was born in Southern California. I really won the lottery of birth. I never had to worry about my health or whether my family, my sister, my parents would be able to access care if they got sick. And I left North America uh, not until I was in college for the first time. Um, I spent some time in a rural village in Senegal with a local organization. And I watched in awe to see the village I lived in build a help post with bricks they made themselves. But despite the courage and the conviction, they had few medications, they had no healthcare worker. And the following year, I got involved in a research study at Mali's medical school. Uh, Mali is one of the poorest countries on the continent and with some of the worst health outcomes. And I met there these brilliant physicians who were pulling out all the stops to connect their patients to care. They were, were visionaries. They saw what a functional health system would look like, even though it didn't exist there. And I found myself living in one of the world's poorest communities on the outskirts of Mali's capital city. I got to know my neighbors and they started coming to me in desperation when they couldn't access care. Um, early in the morning, a, you know, a, parent, a father brought his, his young child who was bit in the neck by a rabid dog and didn't know where to go, didn't know how to connect to care. Um, somebody showed up at our doorstep with their eight-year-old son in a coma. Um, with their sister pregnant and malnourished and hanging on. And I went to funerals again and again, nearly every single week and sometimes more than once for the, the couple of years, the year and a half that I, I was in Mali on the Fulbright. And this was, this was how I spent my weekends. And what I saw that year was that people weren't dying of AIDS or malnutrition or malaria they were dying because they didn't have the transportation to get to a health facility or because they couldn't miss a day selling tomatoes in the market because they needed the income to put food on the table for the next day uh, or because they didn't have the cash in their pocket to pay the fee to, for a consultation uh, or even if they could make it to a health facility because they, they once they arrived, the provider that they saw didn't have the training or the equipment to make the proper diagnosis or prescribe the right treatment. And above all, what I saw was that people were dying from delayed access to care. And so Musso was born out of this realization of how much time matters. Um, you know, it costs a couple, a dollar or two and three pills to treat malaria within the first couple of days of symptom onset. But if you wait, um, it becomes a hospitalization and an IV, um, much more life-threatening and, and, and much more expensive. And so, <clears throat> and Musso, we began as this group of Jews and Catholics and Muslims that came together to face our collective failure as a global community to show up for each other. And we founded Muso based on this premise that nobody should die waiting for healthcare. And so for the past 15 years, we've been working in partnership as this global team and with the government of Mali um, and now in Cote d'Ivoire as well to create a health system that gets people the quality care that they need quickly. Wonderful. It's really fantastic. Uh, Gamal, can you please share with us? Sure. Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to be with you all and good evening, afternoon, wherever you are on the planet. I'm Gamal Palmer, and 
I'm from Philadelphia. Um, I talk a lot about where I'm from because it really did shape so much of who I am. I'm from a place called Westbound area in Philadelphia. And this neighborhood is really distinct. My parents moved there because they were a mixed race couple. They were a multiracial couple and they wanted to raise their children in a multiracial environment. So I grew up with Jews, with Christians, with Muslims, with black folk, white folk, mixed race, Asian. And growing up in this area, you really learn what it could look like to live in a more inclusive and diverse world. And so that coupled with my parents being activists and me going to needle exchanges, my mom actually started one of the first needle exchanges in the country where heroin addicts can bring uh, dirty needles in exchange for clean ones to prevent the spread of HIV. So I grew up volunteering there on Saturday mornings rather than maybe being at a soccer game like a lot of the other kids in the neighborhood. And my father, as I said, is a civil rights activist. And so all of these things really shaped who I am and going through my own journey, my own identity journey of really sort of self-discovering all of the multiple parts of, of my identity, whether that was in theater and working in prisons when I was in eighth grade or when I was in university, actually working in what is now Eswatini, um, which is uh, formerly known as Swaziland, where I started a theater for social change and public health program where we work with public health workers themselves throughout Swaziland and South Africa to explore what is it like to be searching for, for a cure to a disease that has no end, right? And the impact, the emotional and psychological impact and all of the challenges that come with social challenges and public health challenges racial justice challenges, all of these things are, I've somehow touched me in one way or another. And I was really fortunate to be able to go to Yale School of Management for my postgrad associate and continue to understand how to take passion and emotion-based sort of um, questions um, and bring that into a strategy, right? And, and to help people go from how do you show up in your organizations or in your communities in a way that excludes and how can you change that? And so that is how I really got to be where I am now and uh, working in the Jewish community specifically for the past 10 years has been an extra layer of um, not only um, fulfillment, but also this idea of questions and this idea of the multiple ways in which we as Jews have a responsibility and fulfill in our responsibility to make this a better, a more inclusive and a more just world. Beautiful. That's a really powerful story. Uh, Carly, can you please share? Thank you, Lisa. And it's great to be with you all. So I was born and raised in the UK, as I hope you can still hear, despite the fact that most of the time I live in New York now. Um, and I grew up in a kind of traditional Jewish home where my parents really encouraged that we from very early on understand that, you know, we were in a privileged position that much of the world isn't. It's pretty normal in the UK to consider taking a year out between school and college. So I was very clear that I was gonna go and do that somewhere where I could volunteer and really kind of roll my sleeves up. So I spent um, most of that year in Buenos Aires, really engaging with communities that, that were struggling a lot and understanding that, you know, when you think about aid and support, you know, that actually you have to do that in a sustainable way. You know, what a lot of the things that I saw there was, you know, delivery of not healthy fast food being given to the, the local communities that actually then meant they had long-term medical problems or, you know, that, uh, that educational materials were being delivered, but, you know, they didn't actually have the, the teachers or the, or the laptops or anything like that to use them. So from, from 18, I felt very strongly about engaging in a sustainable way to work with people to, to help themselves and to, and to be a part of, of the solution. And from there, when I went to university, um, I actually got very involved in activism during the, the crimes that were going on in Darfur at the time. Um, and for me, that was a real moment where my Jewish identity and the, the feelings I already had about how you should look to engage in the world really collided because, you know, I, I chose to study the Rwandan genocide at university. It's what I wrote my dissertation on and Darfur was going on in the world. And at the, at the idealistic age of 1920, I couldn't really understand how, you know, we were already looking at situations in the world again where where genocide and, and these nature of crimes were taking place. So that really underpinned a lot of my, my first few years. I chose to travel a lot in Africa and look to engage 
um, firsthand. And I've now in a privileged position where I get to run a foundation that it has the capabilities to really do something about that. But to look to carry forwards the lessons that I think I learned at 18, which is you have to do this in a sustainable way and in a way that's going to help countries help themselves versus kind of, you know, depositing a lifetime supply of potato chips. Great lessons. Um, Yossi, can you please uh, share a little bit about your journey? Yeah. Hello, everybody. And, and Lisa, I, I love the two lines you said about uh, Judaism um, doesn't recognize reality and that we should be agents of hope. So I guess I've been a unrealistic, uh, uh, trying to be an unreal, you know, an agent of hope my, my, my whole journey. You've been an iconoclast and pioneer <laughs> since I met you in college. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm married to a rabbi. Uh, we have five kids, two from Africa. So I, I think that kind of, you know, I could stop there and you can, you can kind of extrapolate. Um, the, the longer version is that uh, I see myself as a Jewish educator and, and activist and journalist who happens to develop and finance utility scale solar fields in sub-Saharan Africa and the poorest uh, places really as um, kind of a second act to bringing Elad and the Arava to be the first region in the world, uh, you know, with partners uh, to be 100% daytime um, solar powered. I'm a day school kid, which uh, I don't know if it's unusual in the uh, um, but uh, what is unusual is that in eighth grade, I come from an activist family. My dad was at the March in Washington. Um, so in eighth grade, my mom pulled me out of uh, Schechter one day in Newton and took me to civil disobedience training in the basement of uh, uh, um, a church in, in Cambridge. Uh, and and uh, it was against a, a nuclear plant in Seabrook. And that meant that I graduated from eighth grade having a good solid Jewish education and no fear whatsoever of attack dogs, of police, et cetera. Uh, used those uh, in the Soviet Jewry movement, um, uh, in the rescue of Ethiopian Jews, we're celebrating SIGD about now, um, uh, anti-apartheid movement, which was also, uh, and therefore these were, these were moments that, you know, we happen to have actually succeeded in so many of these. So I think I was, I was, I was a lucky footnote to have been em empowered. Um, even if those didn't work, I'd, I'd probably still maintain my idealism because I'm a young Judean, uh, like Alon Tal, Professor Alon Tal, our friend and Knesset member. But, but I, I did start young. Lisa and I were 19 years old when we were APAC uh, interns. So we were empowered at a young age. And I guess my specialty is when there's an issue of justice, right, or injustice, uh, when there's a when there's a violation of Selim and Lokim, you know the, the the dignity that should come to every person being made in God's image. Then my specialty is taking the impossible and make it possible, and take the the impossible, the possible, the newly possible, and and just get it done. Um, and, and I think we're living in a world now where we gotta get it done, and I'm proud to do it as a Jew and a Zionist. Wonderful. And you made a huge impact. So, and now I want to hear from each of you about what you see happening presently. And if you could share based on your experience working in both more developed and less developed countries, what are some of the stories, the statistics that you can share that highlight the ways that today's world is marked by inequality or unsustainable practices? And I think we'll go in reverse order. And Yossi, if you could share with us a little about what you've learned for your work in the climate crisis. All right, live from uh, Glasgow, from COP26. Uh, there, in Africa, there are 600 million people without access to power today. Like, you know, we, we, we have the 6 million as one of those haunting numbers uh, in, in our particular story, but there's 600 million people that don't have the dignity that can enhance their lives of access to affordable and clean power. And there's two to 300 million burning diesel or, you know, uh, fuel oil at the highest prices, most polluting, you know, it, it's, it's extraordinary. And the population of the continent is gonna double in, in one generation. And so there's infinite amount of essentially not affirming Salem Elohim, and there's infinite amount of opportunities really for the mitzvah of, of, of raising 
people up. And for me, the International Declaration of Human Rights, which I think was informed by um, post-Holocaust uh, Jewish lawyers, uh, it, you know, people are guaranteed the right to the dignity of, of health care or education or work. And you can't have that without energy access in today's world. And so, you know, in terms of Africa and climate, they're not really part of the problem. There's a little bit of, you know, I think 4% of the emissions of the world is coming out there. But the effect of the biblical droughts and the vulnerability of the people and, you know, 90 something percent of the People are dependent on agriculture, simple agriculture. You know, what are we doing? And a lot of the power is hydro. And so when there's, when, when climate is changing all of that, it's just, you know, people's livelihoods are at stake and, and we're losing this battle today. Like there, there's more people without power today in Africa than, than when we met in Paris uh, six, six years ago. So we're working in 10 countries. Uh, I'm uh, doing what we did in the Arava. And uh, I'm, I'm actually happy to say that yes, last week we announced we're supplying 10% of the electricity of uh, arguably one of the most poor countries on the planet of Burundi after six difficult years. Um, we've transformed the lives of uh, 87,000 people in small businesses who now have that kind of reliable and, and poor power. And, you know, on the one hand, I'm like, I'm so happy to celebrate that. I'm just like, it, it like I'm, I am brought to tears just, you know, thinking about 87,000 people or homes or, you know, there's a, there's a multiplier effect. And yet we're talking about 600 million people. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of work to do. Absolutely. Uh, okay, Carly, uh, what is your perspective as a funder and activist in international development and humanitarian aid work. So I want to touch on one of the projects we've we focused on this year um, related to COVID-19. Um, the, the founder of the, the family I work for spent most of his uh, early formative years in Eswatini. And therefore, um, for him, when the, when the COVID-19 crisis happened, he was particularly um, focused on, on how Eswatini would, would navigate it. And I will tell you that he, he decided in early January, which those of you who have paid attention will know, most countries ordered their vaccines a year earlier, um, in early January that we were going to try and help Eswatini get hold of both vaccine and the capabilities to roll it out. Um, now, when I started to reach out to Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, they were all very polite, but tried hard not to laugh when I said I'm going to need 1.2 million doses of, of vaccine and we'd like it to be delivered at the same time it'll be delivered everywhere else in the world. Um, they looked to explain to me that, you know, much of the world had ordered their vaccines the second COVID had started. They'd been able to spend large amounts of money on every potential vaccine that was being developed. They had multiple backups. Um, and in the case of some countries, they had ordered enough to vaccinate their populations four or five times over. Eswatini, like much of Africa, was not in that position at all. Um, and as of January, um, this year had not placed any order. They were obviously hopeful for COVAX, but it would be a very long wait for Eswatini. Not just, by the way, the supply, but the capabilities to roll out a vaccination campaign in terms of looking at what Pfizer required before you touch on any of the others to make this possible. Um, now, we, we've rolled out a vaccination campaign in Eswatini and worked, including with one of the Olam organizations, Israel to make that possible. But even with all of the, the resources and the dedication that we as the foundation can put towards it, Eswatini is still an incredibly long way behind the rest of the world. You know, to give you a few statistics, as we all know, Israel has given their third shot to all of the population. Eswatini has got 19.8% fully vaccinated, South Africa 19.2%, Namibia 9% and Malawi is at 2.7% vaccinated. So whilst much of the, the developed world looks to target their third shots, Africa is struggling. And, you know, there, there is no way around that. The, it's not just about supply of the vaccine. It's actually about the ability to roll it out and for everyone to be able to take advantage of the knowledge and the know-how, but also to look to the future and to stop this problem continuing because, you know, the, the intellectual property and the manufacturing of these vaccines is mostly in the hands of the developed world. 
Or, for example, as was the case in South Africa with Johnson and Johnson, where they are helping to manufacture the vaccine. But until there was a big protest, most of that vaccine was then leaving the African continent. So what we've really seen during COVID-19, I'm afraid, is that um, take Africa, for example, that they are the hardest hit. Um, you know, that whilst people make the right noises of, of donating certain amounts and looking to support them, that actually, you know, the, the vaccine nationalism, as it was called, you know, is what was put first. But even if you don't recognize the need to help Africa, if you look at where the variants are coming from in COVID-19, they're coming from countries with low vaccination rates. So, you know, even if countries want to be selfish about it, um, sooner rather than later, they have to help Africa and elsewhere look to, to get an equal footing on vaccinations. Otherwise, the problem isn't going anywhere. It's pretty overwhelming. Uh, thank you. Gamal, what, what can you share based on your work in the area of racial equity and also more broadly diversity and inclusion? Sure, I just wanna, I have to respond to Carly since I found my, uh, so much of who I am in Eswatini and Swaziland when I started working there years ago. And my, uh, my heart goes out to the country and to, you know, to South Africa and many African countries that have really um, been um, the victims of so much oppression for so long. And, you know, the continual sort of challenges that countries face and, you know, in Eswatini in particular, I remember when um, you know HIV, it took them a long time to acknowledge HIV and to really start rolling out medical support and testing and and uh, and you know and medication. So um, the countries come such a long way, and and I agree with you that you know countries who do have more resources and more power really have to figure out how to step up, um, and whether that is for selfish reasons or not. But um, it's important for us to, you know, to do our part and our role. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, you know, what I would say is so much of the challenges that people face in countries, you know, it's like diversity and what we call in the states, diversity, equity and inclusion. It plays out so differently in every country but yet it is there and maybe it's different language, but if you just take and look at, you know, where inequity lives, right? And where lack of inclusion lives within your country or within your sector. And it often does come down to power and to power structures. And so when you look at, you know, the percentage of people who are um, in Tanzania, for example, where only 70% of children from 14 to 17 are, are, are sorry, 17%, uh, uh, 70% of children um, who are from seven to 14 are not enrolled in schools, right? And you look at, um, which means that they can't actually get the education that they need to move through a system that is already so fettered with challenges to take on power positions and power roles. So there's inequity in education in almost every country, um, you know, and certainly that's developing what we call developing and even many of the developed, if you will, countries. Um, and looking at it from a different perspective in the States, the percentage of people who are heads of nonprofits in a few years ago, 80% of the heads of nonprofit organizations in the States were run by white men, right? And so there is a lack of equity, there's a lack of diversity in the power pipelines. And I see this in every country where I was working in Kenya, Tanzania, here in the States. And last year, just alone, I worked with maybe um, 4,000 or so people in different workshop settings, et cetera, in different companies. And out of those people, only 10% of those people were people of color, which lets you know that there is a real deficit in terms of people of color being in leadership roles in the corporate sector and the nonprofit sector, which means that we are missing out. We're missing out on the creativity, we're missing out on the ingenuity that having a diverse ecosystem, a diverse company can bring, which means that we're also missing out on solutions, solutions to solving some of our greatest problems. And what we've also know is that companies who do invest in diversity, have a 34% higher profit margin than companies who don't, right? And that's because we need to be, we need to figure out how to not only bring people into our 
whether it is, again, a, a for-profit organization, a nonprofit organization, our political systems, we need to figure out how to diversify this so that way we can really understand the unique challenges that are relevant to today. Amen, is all I can say to that. Uh, <laughs> So Jessica, um, can you please share based on your expertise in, in global health equity, what you're seeing today? Absolutely. And, um, you know, just building off of what all of my colleagues on the panel have so eloquently already described, I can share you know, the example from Mali is um, really I see most potently in, in terms of maternal and child death. And the, the lifetime risk of maternal death in Mali is 29 uh, this is this is the probability that a 15 year old woman will die eventually from a pregnancy cause, and when you compare that to the rest of the world, in the United States, that number is 3,000, and you know that is that is um, criminally high, mostly because of racism. Um, you look at Italy, that number is 51,300. So in Italy the risk that a 15 year old girl will die of pregnancy is more than 51,000. And in Mali, it's 29. And so, you know, you imagine you're sitting in a room full, a classroom full of, of 29, 15 year old girls and one of them is going to lose their life from pregnancy. And, you know, imagine facing your future, facing pregnancy in Mali, wondering if you're going to be that one. Uh, and the thing is that pretty much all of these deaths are completely preventable with tools that we have known how to treat for almost a century, you know, blood transfusions, antibiotics, um, C-sections, blood pressure medicines. And so the, the potency of that inequity in the possibility of survival um, uh, is something that we have to take a closer look at as a global community. And we talk about kids for a moment, um, globally more than 5 million kids die every year before their fifth birthday. And nearly all of those deaths are also in impoverished countries uh, and nearly all of those deaths are preventable. Uh, we also have the tools to prevent them. They're well-proven tools. And so as Lisa mentioned in Mali, um, the government recently published a seven year evaluation of our health system model that we have implemented with the government. And it found a tenfold increase in access to care um, and a 10x drop in the child death rate uh, in the area where we work with the government. So starting from 154 deaths per 1,000 live births to a sustained child death rate at or below 28 per 1,000 for five years and running. And that is a rate lower than any country in Sub-Saharan Africa. And ultimately we achieved an under five death rate of seven per 1,000 which also happens to be the rate of under five death in the United States. So it is possible, um, as Yosef said, you know, proving, proving what we think is impossible is actually possible and, and it can be the beginning because now we're, we're all out of excuses, right? We have seen equity in this outcome in this place. Um, and you know, certainly the study has important limitations and we've followed up on it with a large randomized controlled trial that we just completed and are now analyzing. Um, but ultimately seven per 1000 is not a MUSO achievement. That's, that's an achievement of the communities that we serve. And more importantly, it represents this common aspiration. It represents our common moral mandate. Um, and, and for me, it represents equity. So you know, I think we have to make these results, the story of our world. And to do this, we have to be ready as a global community to invest um, you know, 10 or $20 more per person per year in healthcare for the most vulnerable communities. And that seems like an obvious investment, but I can't tell you how many conversations I have had about whether that is a sustainable price tag. Um, and so the ways, ultimately the ways that we value people's lives or don't, the ways that we define who will receive care and who will not as a global community has fundamentally got to change. And this is why we see the story of maternal and child survival as a human rights issue. Wow. Well, thank you for, for getting it done in Mali and um, there's so much more work to be done. So uh, this is where we're going to ask each of you to articulate your vision of what the world could and should be. 
So I want to ask each of you to share and speak about an image. It could be a photograph, a cartoon, a work of art, anything that you think best captures your vision of a more equitable and sustainable future. And we'll give about two minutes per, and uh, I'd like to start with uh, Yossi. Okay, so um, I assume the administrator is going to share a photo. Um, Diana somehow managed to get an Olam trip right at the edge, the beginning edge of, um, of COVID to, we went to Rwanda. Um, and so uh, to Agahosa Shalom and, and to other places. So this is from the Olam trip. Uh, and this is in the solar field. This is in Africa's first utility scale solar field which is located at the Aga Hosea Shalom um, Youth Village, which is a member of Olam. And I, I love this um, picture and partnership because it, 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 it's a new model. It's an NGO working for a Jewish values-based impact uh, investment platform. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's a hybrid. Um, again, we're supplying 6% of the country's power and we, and we were able to disassociate um, growth, um, economic growth from emissions growth. In other words, Rwanda kept growing without adding more emissions. 30% uh, of the people working on the field are women. This is the deputy uh, manager of the plant. So um, uh, just love that. And it was nice that she, she was there. Um, and, and also what happened was just from a strategic perspective, because we said to the Rwanda electric company, we'll handle generation, we'll create the energy. You, you focus on interconnections. So um, when we started building the field, only 20% of the people in the villages around Agahosa Shalom were connected and had the dignity and the, and the productive use of power uh, to improve their lives. And when we were there with Olam, I found out that that number is now 80% of the people are interconnected. So just as a uh, you know, it is ultimately about people and uh, you know the employment and the people's lives that you touch. But when eighty percent of the people now have access to power in a region where it's only twenty percent before, and obviously it's green power and it's cheaper than diesel, and it's you know it, it, it the fact that we you know there's an Israeli flag uh, on this it, it means the world to me that we're you know I, I I think our values in action here and also supporting women. I mean. Uh, you know, girls uh, and women suffer most, I think, uh, un under climate, trying to look for water and for wood. And so the, this, this to me is a hopeful picture and uh, it's me standing behind her. So we, you know, <laughs> so th this picture is meaningful to me. Thank you. Love it. So beautiful. Um, okay, Gamal, can you share yours, please? Sure. So um, I don't know if it's, up or not, I can't tell how this is all working, but uh, there it is. Um, so this is a painting by B. Robert Moore. And um, for those who don't know, this is a very famous cartoon, um, an American cartoon, but it's reimagined. And that's what this artist does. He reimagines sort of classic cartoons and images to have them express the way that he sees the world moving forward. And so you can see these are two male um, figures who are kissing each other and um, giving that loving sort of expression. And really for me, this is about, this is very layered. Um, it's about saying that the things that we knew before, the structures, the, thing, the, the norms um, in society that we thought would make us um, good people and productive people, that we have to actually change that. Um, and that we have to really open our minds and to be much more accepting of the different ways in which we love each other, the different ways in which we partner with each other, and also that the images of the past ha have a real impact on us, right? And so if we don't have more images that look like all of the different people that exist today, then it, we will actually be stuck in the past. Right. And so we need to reimagine not only placing ourselves in the past, but of course, also what we want to be and how we want to be in the future. And then I would also say from 
a system standpoint, support, supporting artists. So supporting artists who and entrepreneurs and innovators, people who are really thinking differently. And again, as I was saying before, to create those economic pipelines and those power pipelines so that people can have their voice and they can really help us move forward to a more inclusive world. And I will just say that last night, I was um, really fortunate to go to an unveiling of Kehende Wild's new um, new uh, painting at the Huntington Library here in Los Angeles. And he's the person who painted the portraits of the Obamas. And he has this image of a very famous um, Thomas uh, Gainsborough image of the, the, blue, the blue boy, which is this old, you know, from the 1800s. And you can see the, the one painting from the 1800s looking at Kehende's piece, which is a, the same sort of idea, but it's a black figure and he's in modern clothes with an Apple watch in this very old historic art gallery called the Huntington uh, Library. And so this is what we need to do. We need to bring the new vision that we have and the real challenges that we have today and have them looking at the past. And so we can really reckon with ourselves to see who do we want to be. Wow. New ways of loving, new ways of thinking, new ways of imagining a more inclusive future. I, I love it. Um, and before we go to our, our other two panelists, I invite everyone in the audience to articulate your own vision for a more inclusive and equitable future uh, by putting your thoughts into the chat function and sharing with us. So we would love to see what's on your minds and what you're dreaming about for the future. Um, and while we're doing that, I will pass it over to Carly. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so I've chosen um, to highlight Innovation Africa um, and the work that we do with them. Yossi, I've, I've visited your photo, so I'm, I'm very glad that we, uh, we didn't trip over each other, and that's certainly a vision for the future. Um, I want to go back to what I said at the beginning, and, and what I love about Innovation Africa and why, to me, it's part of the future is not just bringing water and power to as many of, of African countries as we can, but doing it in a sustainable way that creates jobs, creates training and, and responsibility. You know, before Innovation Africa commits to go into a village, each village has to form a water committee where they bring together those who, who want to take ownership and make sure that that, that water is, is looked after, is protected, that there is a security budget. They work out how much the village can afford to contribute. But also each well that's dug in each borehole is responsible for jobs in the village. So that also creates training. And my, my favorite thing, which I think the CEO of Innovation Africa is listening and she'll roll her eyes because I talk about this obsessively, is, is what happens after. And actually Innovation Africa has just brought on board a PhD student who's spending a few months in Tanzania. And what they're doing is looking at the effects of water on these villages over several years. So what does the village look like one year after water, two years after water, three, and even in four or five? And what's unbelievable is the tangible economic effects on the ground, whether it's the small businesses that Jessica touched on that she sees or, or whether it's the, the diversity of what's available in the shop. You know, initially a year into water, it's a very small shop with, with very limited supplies. Five years into water, there is four or five kinds of different fruit and vegetables to choose from because the village has, has made that kind of a progression. And so for me, you know, Innovation Africa is now in a position to be doing one village every two days. And in the next five years, they have a plan to do a village a day. So if we look at that future and actually that future happens in partnership with the work of Yossi and Jessica and Gamal, then for me, that's a pretty great world that we can look forward to. We've still got a long way to go, but we're getting there. That's fabulous. Wonderful. Okay, Jessica, can you please, please share your, your image? Sure. Um, this is an image that my good friend, uh, social science researcher and educator, Mickey Davis created. His focus is in education equity, but I think his cartoon here is a profound statement about the root causes of inequities globally. So there are two apple orchards. One apple orchard on the surface looks to be doing pretty well, and the other one, not so much. The soil is not fertile, so the trees are not producing many apples, so the farmers can't afford very good equipment, which then reinforces this poor harvest cycle. But this is not an accident of nature, right? The soil on this side didn't just happen to be fertile and then not fertile on the other side. There's this aquifer that's under the surface 
that could be supplying both orchards with water, but one orchard is extracting all the water which should be shared. So how does this underground aquifer extraction impact global health? Well, we, the histories of slavery, of colonialization, of unfair trade policies have impacted the political and economic realities of many countries. And in so doing, have affected the health of the people. And then you have climate change, um, Yosef knows too, too much about, and um, that disproportionately is caused by carbon output in service to privileged countries, and yet it's told disproportionately affects the world's poor, especially farmers. And as Carly so potently described, rich countries' ability to lobby pharmaceuticals for COVID vaccines impacts access to citizens of impoverished nations. And so these are just a few examples. Uh, my mentor, Joya McCurgy, uh, estimates that there's $192 billion out of Africa every year. And that's in illegal fishing and logging, tax exemption, um, unfair profits by multinational corporations, remittances, and so on. And that's compared, so $192 billion out compared to $30 billion in, in overseas aid. And so even today, resource extraction continues to enrich powerful nations outside of Africa and impoverished people on the continent. Um, you know, I'm always moved by thinking about the millions of dollars USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, gives to Mali every year. And on the surface, this may seem like a benevolent act of charity, but it's, it's not even a fraction of the tolls that our current and historical impact have had on the country's economy. One estimate calculates that the US government cotton subsidies to farmers annually causes Malian farmers $43 million in potential sales. Um, so to create a more equitable future and a world where people have access to survival, um, we have to acknowledge this history and, and our power to make a change. And we ourselves, our families, our communities, and our governments have to make decisions in support of retribution and, and redistribution of resources and, and global human rights. And as a core of that, we have to deal with racism, which I really think is a big part of why, um, why we see these inequities. Thank you so much. Um, could not agree more. So um, now that we've seen your really powerful images, could you each reflect briefly, very briefly on the question, how do Jewish texts, Jewish history, Jewish culture inform the visions that you just articulated? And Jessica, I'll go, I'll go back to you since uh, you just had the floor. Sure. Um, so tzedek, usually translated as charity, right? Um, but, but actually it's justice. To, to pursue tzedek mitzvot is to do something very different than good deeds with charity. It means feeling our own personal imperative and calling to pursue justice. Um, tzedek, 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 justice, justice, pursue it. So this work has been part of my Jewish practice. Um, I will never forget watching that first child die in front of me on an exam table, um, holding his mother as she wails in my arms in disbelief. Uh, you know, once you have that kind of experience once you see how necessary it is to create a different kind of health system. And once you see how little it takes to fix it, you can't turn back. And God has given us immense capacity to build justice in the world. Uh, you know, tear it off. It's, it's an imperative. Pursue it. Um, right. So, so when I encounter these injustices, I, I, I feel that imperative. Um, the Torah says, justice, justice, pursue it so that you should live. This work for justice, you know, it, it makes you come alive. It makes all of us come alive when we're engaged in it with integrity. And, um, you know, and then also the Torah, the Torah asks of us to love our fellow person as ourselves. Um, you should love your fellow person as yourself. I am God. And people talk about this all of the time. But, you know, I think it's really hard. <laughs> and pretty radical, this idea that you should be, you know, we should be valuing the lives of other people as we value our own lives. Um, this verse suggests to me that when we get close to that, um, that that's an experience of the presence of Hashem. And if we could really pull this off, really have that kind of compassion and love 
for another human that is suffering, um, you know, the kind that I would have for myself or for my mother or my son, um, if they were sick, then, then I would do everything in my power to help them get care when they were sick. And we would be that close to God. I know, uh, I know that the resources exist to provide essential health care to the world's poor citizens. Um, I'm an OBGYN now, and I work um, a little bit in U.S. hospitals in addition to my ongoing work in West Africa. And I see our civilization invest hundreds of thousands of dollars to save the sacred life of one patient um, without blinking an eye. And it's not even a question. And it is a heavy, you know, it, it's heavy to accept our privilege and power and to ask ourselves what capacity we have as individuals to, to make a change so that that kind of valuing of life um, permeates the world and, and to sit with that fear, to engage with it, um, you know, that fear of our our own power, um, because we are so much more powerful than we realize each of us. And, and these are uncomfortable questions to ask ourselves, but that discomfort opens a door. Um, and especially within the moral framing of the Torah, um, when we see our own power, we have the responsibility to act. And, uh, I know it's possible for us to build a world where we're devoted as to each other as, as humans, uh, where every life, even those living in the most extreme poverty is protected as a sacred member of the human family. And, um, and so that's, that's how being a Jew um, relates to this work for me. You articulated that so powerfully. And I just want to say, you know, so let it be written. So let it be done. Um, Gamal, can you please share? Sure. Um, I would say sort of two um, pieces here. One is when um, God said to Abraham, he said, Lech lecha, go, like go from your homeland, go from your house, you know, and, and go from your father's house and, and really go and search for the land that I'll show you, right? And, to, and I think what, for me, what that means is that we have to get out of, as I said before, what we know, right? Where, where, where we've come from has gotten us where we are, but it may not get us to where we want to be. And that we need to go from what we understand to, you know, the, again, the power, right? We have to do more to look at how can we let go of power? You know, I work with a lot of leaders and board members and CEOs, and, you know, there's this sort of underlying concern that what will happen if I give away my power, what will I lose? And rather than thinking, what will I gain, right? And when you think about the Mishkan and, you know, and God said to everyone that to bring their own unique gifts, whoever wants to come and to bring their own unique gifts into the tent, I will receive them, right? And so we need to see this as when we leave our comfort zones, when we leave our power, and it doesn't mean that we're necessarily losing it all. In fact, we're gaining something. We're gaining the gift of other people's gifts. We're gaining the knowledge and the perspective so that we can have a greater tent and a wider tent. And so for me, it's really about this sort of push pull of leaving from, you know, from what you know to go to find the land that we want to create and where we want to be and where there can be justice and peace. But also when we get there, that we have to be able to allow for all of those who have gifts, which we all do, to bring them into the tent so that we can be enriched by one another and that we can really build a new future. So inspiring. Thank you. Uh, Carly. I'm not sure how I can follow either of those two, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> um, so this is actually very easy for me because our, our founder has a Jewish text and principle that guides everything we do or as much as possible. I will say in COVID, we've had to reevaluate it a little. But, but for us, it's, it's all about Maimonides is teaching that the highest form of tzedakah is to enable a person to earn their own living and to, to be in a position to, to help themselves. And if you look at often what, what the right kind of foreign aid or support can, can be, that, that can really help further that principle. I, I will say during COVID, we've had to do a bit of an evaluation and kind of develop a combination of fishing rods and fish. Um, because, you know, particularly in, in Africa, where we do a lot of work, 
you know, fish, fish was what people needed at that point. And, you know, we, we have learned to be flexible and that the mission and our, and our values can help guide us, but you have to be able to, to reevaluate them, you know, so to return to Eswatini for a minute, you know, actually most of what we've done this year has been fish, be it in terms of, you know, helping with, with food relief or medical relief and, and helping to build oxygen plants. And although where we could, we've, We've carried the Maimonides quote with us. So we've brought local workers and helped train them. You know, at the end of the day, when people are starving and they need oxygen, you know, you sometimes have to put that, that mantra to one side. But I think, you know, to touch on what on what both Jessica and Gamal have said, you know, we're we're very fortunate that there is a huge number of Jewish texts that can help lead us um, in this work. And, and actually, if you if you rely on them, you know, it's you you can't be steered wrong. Absolutely. Uh, and Yossi, um, I know your, your rabbinical wife uh, <laughs> gives you reminders all the time. So can you please <laughs> close out this question? Uh, well, first of all, the other speaker, and also just Jessica, the, that image of that kid and, and all the values that you pull out of that speaks to me. Um, I guess I'll add, therefore, a little bit of the some of the historical um, answer, which is, it's very interesting. When you look at Theodor Herzl's diary, he, he actually writes that after he brings about the redemption of his people in the ancient homeland, he was going to work for the redemption of the Blacks in Africa, meaning from colonialism and the indignities that come from it, which is, it's so strange. Uh, I mean, he was that visionary in certain terms of seeing um, kind of parallel paths uh, at the turn of the century. And so, you know, we're one of those families that that is fighting for the soul of, of the Jewish state and what, what, what does that mean to have our own sovereignty and, and, and put our values in action. And my vision is that Israel should and is on the verge of being a superpower of goodness, particularly in Africa, through our industries of goodness, right? You heard Carly and others talk about, you know, water, agriculture, green energy, energy access, medical um, and to do so in partnership with world Jewry, with Jewish communities around the world. Uh, to, to me, you know, we're a little country and we, we've always, and we're a small people, but we've always had some sort of disproportionate moral influence. Ten Commandments is the greatest branding, you know, leverage play uh, ever. And, and, and I think this notion of how do we become the superpower of mitzvot, of goodness, of, of, of chesed is important. And, and, and so I see... And, and I've come to this strange realization that it's either, it's not only our charitable works, but it's, it's, it's blended finance, like it's a mitzvah to have a blended finance model or a business model for tikkun olam. Like, I'm, cause, 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 you know, I, I think now everything has to scale. Like we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, and uh, it was Herzl who said, Im tirtsu agada, if you will, it, it is no dream. The, the one Jewish text I'll just add is, is a um, Shema, we have an alternative um, second paragraph of the Shema, which is uh, God putting before us the blessings and the, and the curse. The and we have to choose life, we have to choose what life. And, and for all the reasons we know and all the reasons we heard from, from, from my, my, my friends on the panel, but, it, but, the end, but the reason is such a strange reason, and I only understood it recently. It says, um, so, so that you may live. And so this interconnectedness is, is really biblical and spiritual and, and deep and, and interconnectedness of the forces of life, as well as the interconnectedness of the, the dark forces, you know, of death that, you know, have some that threatens so many, so many people. And, and through my journey of choosing life and trying to bring life and to strengthen life, I realize that I've chosen life, uh, you, know, a, 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 you know, difficult um, and challenging path, but it's, it's a path that I feel alive and, and Jewish, and fortunate J Jewish um, being on it. Beautiful. So many layers of what it means to, to choose life. Really incredible. So um, let's finally talk about taking action. And this question is, of course, for all of you. Practically speaking, what can the people who are watching this webinar do now to move the world closer to the visions that you all have articulated? What are practical steps that people can take? Um, Yossi, let's, let's start with you. 
All right, thank you. It's just, again, thank you everybody in the room. So like, uh, so one is I'm flying from Glasgow right to Cape Town. I don't know if there's any OLA members in Cape Town, but I'd love to see you and meet you. Maybe we'll do an event because I'm, I'm going right into the lion's den and I'm keynoting Africa's oil conference uh, next week. So uh, somebody be in touch and put like contact info and let's connect the forces of light and happy, happy to see you. The other is... Um, Look, we, uh, as, you know, we're an impact social business and it's and we've learned to become a, a blended model um, operation. And so we have about 130 foundations, donors and impact investors. Some of them are on. Hello to, and thank you. Um, we need to get to about 150. So it's not um, ever like I'm like we, we, we can get there. Um, and, the, and the more resources, and this is true whether an NGO or an impact um, business, the more resources we're able to tap, the more good that we can do. But the other thing is, is that I would love to, you know, those of you who are on the Zoom who have, you know, um, programs, technologies, services that you can offer, would love to use our hubs where we're already have staff or solar fields or about to have solar fields and kind of leverage a critical mass in, in each of these places, the way we have it at Agahoso. But, um, uh, and we entered Burundi because of Tevel Betzedek in part, for example. So we're in 10 different countries and would love to be in touch. Um, you know, I can give the whole speech about climate and what we need to do. You know what you need to do, like lower your meat, go electric. Uh, on this crazy flight during the climate conference and to the oil thing, I've, I've sponsored 40 trees to more than double my carbon offset, just as a small, tiny uh, uh, example. But uh, let's let's work together, let's pool resources, let's leverage like crazy. And what, I, what I'm hearing now out of the climate conference is that, you know, in Paris, everyone was talking about billions, now we're talking about trillions. So I think we're being challenged to think bigger and faster as a, as a species. And I, and, I, and I hope that's now going to be true for the Jewish people. Thank you. Uh, Carly, can you please go next? So I think this sector can be a little intimidating if you're, you know, watching it from afar. I think it's different if you're, you know, somebody like Yossi who's able to kind of, as he says, go straight into the lion's den and Yossi will have to connect about Cape Town later. Okay. But, um, but I think if you're, if you're watching it at home, this can seem a little far away. Um, the first thing, and I think this is, you know, what Gamal's been saying is inequality is all around us. You don't have to necessarily look to Africa to decide you're going to solve that problem. So, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but but these kinds of things can begin at home. So I think you shouldn't necessarily think, OK, this is happening thousands of miles away. There's nothing I can do. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, funding helps. And that may also seem simplistic, but take one of your Olam partners at the moment, Israel, who's, you know, working on a huge rescue mission to bring um, refugees out of Afghanistan. You know, there's a crowd fund me page on, on their website and it takes ten thousand dollars for sponsorship of a private um private sponsorship to bring someone to the US. You know, we're talking about the inequality on women and, and girls, and, and that's really who they are championing and focusing on. Um, but I also think use, use your voice, be it on, on social media or on any of your, your platforms, you know, challenge people around you when they, when they are uh, ill-informed or when they're talking even about kind of some of this vaccine nationalism, you know, the statistics are all out there. And then, you know, there's one quote that always sticks with me, which is never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world, because actually it's the only thing that ever has. Absolutely. Uh, Jessica. You know, Yosef, Yosef, your point about interconnectedness really resonates with me, um, that our, our liberation is bound up in one another, right? It's 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 just as important to me that we deal with this injustice and equity as it is to the person in front of me who is suffering. Because until we deal with it, we we both live in a broken world, right? Um, and and working in global health has really um, allowed me to see how we are powerful beyond our greatest imagination, um, both. You know, as individuals, um, both both in our potential for harm and for for good, um, and you know, as Jews, we're we're supposed to tide, right? We're supposed to give of ourselves um, 
until we feel uh, we, we, we feel it a little bit, it, you know, um, um, and, and it's not because we are giving a, a, a benevolent, doing a benevolent act of charity. It's because we don't own everything that we have, um, uh, the Torah says, right? And so um, it, it's just not ours in the first place. And um, that's why we, we tithe. And so I think if we want to live in an, in an equitable world, we, we have to ask ourselves what what does retribution look like? Um, and that takes reckoning. Uh, we, we have to ask ourselves, how have I been a perpetrator of injustice? Because my neighborhood, my whiteness, my country has benefited at the expense of other communities. And so, um, you know, what is truly uh, maybe not mine? Um, and how can I use my power to create justice and healing. And we have to ask ourselves these hard questions. I think that's where this, um, the, the solution begins um, to get us to a more equitable world. And we have to ask our children these questions and we have to bring them up around dinner tables, you know, at Shabbat uh, meals. And uh, um, I think the solution really starts um, with each of us uh, figuring out how we can use our own personal power to bring that justice. So, uh, Gamal, can you bring us home on this one? Sure. Um, I'm I, because I know we have multiple uh, audiences here. So, you know, just some top line things. I think that we, you know, for grant for granting organizations, we just have to be more creative with how we um, think about uh, giving funds, and you know, if things don't fit into our particular models or, or uh, avenues for funding that perhaps we need to just be a little bit more innovative and a little bit different um, considering where we're at today. And, and if we really do want to support inclusivity and we want to support voices that haven't been engaged, that means that we maybe don't have exactly the right pipeline for those people to be engaged. I would also say that, you know, we need to really push diversity, equity, and inclusion on our boards Every single board of directors should be having a diversity, equity, inclusion strategy um, and, and, and a process. There should be diversity, equity, inclusion should be on the budget lines of all nonprofit organizations, uh, even those who are you know, led by and serving the communities where they're from. Um, I think we need to really invest in your local schools, even if you don't have children. Um, it's important for us to really figure out how we are going to support the education pipelines that are right here in our own homes, wherever those homes are. And that we, you know, we need practical strategies and we need data, but we also need to invest in human development. We need to invest in people's self-actualization because the reason why they're not doing it is because they don't know how to do it or they don't even know that it's a thing that could be done and we need to help us all elevate to a new understanding and a new level of ourselves so we can step into our leadership in better and greater ways and i would say just to make sure that you're bringing consultants and other voices that are, are not necessarily in your ecosystem because they are not they're not biased and they're not, you know, they, they don't have that sort of lack of objectivity um, to really help navigate some of these, these times and these changes. And two more things, which is to get involved in your local politics. It is no joke. We are at a very major changing point right now. Um, and uh, it, we should all feel a little uh, awake and alert to, to this. And then lastly, to create the opportunity with the people next to you to feel seen and heard. And for you to actually see people and hear people that you typically don't, that are actually your next door. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, we are coming near the close, but I wanna at least take one question from the audience and I'm gonna ask each of you in like 15 to 30 seconds, what is something that is giving you hope? Gamal. Um, something that gives me hope is that, uh, at least in the States, um, we have had a real reckoning with race over the past two years. And uh, more than ever, companies and organizations are actually starting to make changes and lean into what has been systemic racism since the beginning of this country and how that has impacted the current um, uh, organizational cultures and values and um, ways in which we do business. 
Yossi. So now that I'm an old guy, um, I've um, uh, I've gotten to take a lot of pleasure from the um, the Mecha'at Lenoir, the Manaklim. This is the strike for this is the Greta group uh, in Israel. And two days ago, there's two there's two girls, one 15 and one 16, Alma and Leah Lev, who came to Glasgow with such hope and they have a letter signed by all these Israeli teenagers that they they just needed to get to the prime minister. And of course, you know, there, there's no way for them to get to the prime minister. And uh, so I, there are too many security zones away in the whole thing. So I kind of scoop them up and, 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 and get them in or wait. And he's, you know, he's addressing the world leaders and everything. And we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And, and, you know, it's unlikely that we're going to find him. And then, boom, he's, he comes out. We call out to him. And the girls go chasing, right? And he turns around because he hears Hebrew. Uh, and, 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 and he comes back and he talks to the girls. And, and they explain that they're representing the future generation Israel. They, they hand him the letter. He promises them that he's going to meet them um, back in Israel when, when we're all back. And I just have to say that, you know, I've been largely grounded uh, in Israel um, because of COVID, not going to Africa as often. So I've used those extra hours in, in the week to, to really work with um, the, the youth movements. Um, and the, um, they, they give me so much hope. And they've, thankfully, also, some of their leaders have had the stage here. Uh, and, you know, in Paris, we were all, the images we we're worried about were like the polar bears and things like that. And this time we're worried about the kids because they're they're standing up and they're, they're you know, Gamal, how did you say it? Like, be, be present in their leaderships or something along those lines. And oh my God, I was really relatively feisty when I was young, but these 15 and 16 year olds. Yes. Great. Great. Yes. <laughs> Great. Uh, Carly. So I, I think I have the, the easiest job of anyone on the panel in the sense that, you know, I get to, I get to grant money to, to the amazing people doing this important work. You know, I go back and forth to Africa, but but I don't actually do much on the front line. So actually what, what gives me hope is the people who, who really choose to prioritize this work. You know, Jessica could have, could have stayed in California and, uh, you know, and not chosen to, to really roll her sleeves up. And the organizations I work with who are members of Olam are the most inspiring, um, incredible people who choose every day to prioritize this work versus, to be honest, having an easy life um, in wherever they they come from. So, you know, we, we've we still got a long way to go and we're not there yet. But actually, you know, I think even just the members around the alum table should give us all hope. OK, and briefly, Jessica, what gives you hope? Seeing a functional health system in, in some of the world's most um, vulnerable places uh, is an incredible. It's incredible to see how resilient it can be and we've seen even through an al-Qaeda um, uh, infiltration and a coup d'etat that um, a, a strong and resilient health system is possible um, uh, e e even in some of the, the, the most trying contexts and to see um, you know talk to community health workers who uh, who have story after story of um, how their communities are different how they're you know they're not seeing kids um, who are at advanced okay. stages of illness again and you know talking to local imams they haven't officiated a burial for a child in two years in their village you know um, things are different and, and it's palpable and it's possible thank you thank you um, well, I, I learned so much from all of you um, and uh, just quickly some themes of the, the moral mandate, the responsibility, the privilege, the power we have as Jews, how radical our tradition is to uphold human dignity and pursue justice and do it in a sustainable way. Just the need, no matter how big the problem is, to move into action, to do something, to get something done, um, to look at the toll racism has taken and the need for equity and diversity and inclusion and more people of color and leadership, but really to think about how do we value human life? How are we gonna use our power? How are we going to reimagine a different way of thinking and loving and creating a more inclusive and equitable society? Each one of us, as we have seen from our panel has done that. And all of us who are watching can do something and make a really tangible difference for not that much money 
and, and not that much time. So that's what our Jewish values call on us to do. It's what they inspire us to do. Each and every one of you is so inspiring and have made such an impact um, by embodying Jewish values and really taking action. So thank you for taking the world that is and helping us get to the more just and equitable and sustainable world that could and should be. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, Diana. Lisa, thank you so, so much um, for facilitating this session and also for getting us started for the next two days. We are now going to turn our attention to a Moments of Inspiration video. Over the course of Focal Point, we'll be screening three such videos, each of which shines a spotlight on the work of an individual, an organization, or a group. As you can imagine, there were many stories to choose from and we decided to focus on stories that are not as widely known. This first video is about David Hertz, a Brazilian born chef and social entrepreneur. And like Dr. Jessica Beckerman, he is also an awardee of the Charles Bronson Prize. I was always inspired by the entrepreneurship of my grandfather, all of those that came from Europe to Brazil to find a life. It took me a long time to define what would I want to do in life. I took part in the first class of college of gastronomy, culinary skills. And when I graduated, I became a chef. But when I was 30, I really asked myself and God, what should I do with all this learning? So I joined a nonprofit that worked in one favela in Sao Paulo which are places that the state has no control. It's all controlled by drug dealers. As I go up and I see all the houses closed, I ask myself, what people eat in those kitchens? It reminded me that's the place that I can build my dreams. I started Castro Motiva with Uridea. She lives in a favela. She was 19. And I said, Uridea, you went through hunger. You are unemployed. You have issues with your family but let's do this together. So we started with supporting five people to learn the culinary skills. So nowadays we have a kitchen training program for kitchen assistants. We have a program for cooks and chefs, and we have a program for entrepreneurs from very low income areas, all related to food. We have trained more than 6,500 people in five cities in Brazil in South Africa, in El Salvador with the World Food Program, and in Mexico. When COVID hit, we had an idea to get the former students of Gastromotiva to turn their houses into a place that they cook 1,500 meals a month. We were able to open 50 kitchens in three cities in Brazil, and that became the most important project for Gastromotiva nowadays. And now we run 80 kitchens, we are running 10 kitchens in the Amazon, we are running in Salvador, and the vision for this project is that a communal kitchen can make a food system change in a low-income community. I could never imagine to get a prize like the Charles Bronfman Prize. I never knew that those Jewish values could raise into something so important. Kumolam, of course, is the main thing, but the respect for others, the tolerance to use work and the power of like opportunities to help and support others. These are all Jewish values. <laughs>